How's it going everyone? I hope you're all doing good. Welcome to another study session. In this one, we are going to be learning about the anatomy of the spine. So if you haven't noticed already or watched the previous videos, I'm gradually covering the entire skeleton. I recently covered the skull and so next up here is the spine. So first of all, what is the spine? Well, your spine or backbone is your body's central support structure. There are three major masses connected to the spine. These are the skull, the rib cage, and the pelvis. And here I'm starting to draw these out whilst simplifying their forms. And I'll be covering all of them in depth in their own video because in this one, like I said, I will focus on the spine. So looking at the spine on these drawings of the figure here, you can see its shape as it rotates around. On a front view and also on a back view, it obviously appears as a straight line, but as it rotates around to a three quarter view and then on a side view, you can see how the spine curves around. From the skull, it comes down and curves the most around the rib cage and also curves into the pelvis. And my sketches here might not be the best way to illustrate this. I will be drawing this out again towards the end of the video once I've learned more about the spine. Also, moving forward throughout these study sessions, I'm going to begin showing more images and information on screen alongside my own drawings in an effort to best explain all of this. So right now on screen, there is an image of a spine. Again, this is a front, side and back view, the same as I had just drawn. Now, you can see how the curve is actually quite subtle. Just ignore all of the annotation for the time being. This is just to give you a, an idea of its shape. You've probably noticed as well that the spine appears very complex and that's because, well, because it is, but do not worry, rarely will you be drawing the spine in all of its detail. In fact, in Michael Hampton's book, figure drawing design and invention. He simplifies the spine down to a single line, emphasizing its shape. And so here I will do the same. I'm firstly drawing the spine on a front three quarter view using some ellipses to indicate its change in direction. Next to this, I will draw the spine using a series of cylinders. Again, the angle of these clarifies the shape of the spine. Finally, the spine is drawn as a single line, which does best to, again, show the shape of the spine, stripped of all its detail. And so now I will do the same again below, but from a back three quarter view. Now before we continue, I'm going to spend some time here drawing the spine in detail solely for the purpose of having it as a reference in my sketchbook here, but as I said, being able to draw the spine in detail like this won't be of much benefit to you, nor would it be practical in any way. Instead, when you draw the spine, you will be simplifying its form. However, this does not mean that being aware of its detail and having a, a good understanding of the anatomy is of no use to you because it's that knowledge that allows you to simplify it down to a basic line whilst being aware of the important features. Personally, as I'm taking the time to study anatomy, I'm always reminding myself that the more you know about what you are drawing, the better your drawing will be. Anyways, I have the spine drawn on a three quarter view like so, and now it's time to learn about its structure. Now, it's the function of the spine that is actually responsible for its structure, and these basic functions are of course movement, supporting the body, and also protecting the spinal cord. In Stonehouse's anatomy book, he explains how there is a, an important contradiction, and that is that the spinal column, which moves the body, acts as a, a pillar. It needs to be flexible, but it can't be too soft as it's supporting some body parts and also protecting that spinal cord. And this is why, as a result, it's one of the most complex structures of the skeleton. The spine is divided into 24 vertebrae, and between each of these, there is an intervertebral disc. Now, these 24 vertebras are divided into three categories, and the vertebrae in these categories have a different structure. So here on screen, you can see how the first seven vertebrae are referred to as the cervical vertebrae, and these make up the neck bone. The next 12 
are the thoracic vertebra making up the backbone. And then there are five in the lower back referred to as the lumbar vertebra. There's also the sacrum which curves around at the bottom of the spine and the coccyx bone is at the end of that. Now, like I said, there are also these vertebral discs between them and these are what allow the spine to move and flex in either direction. So it's a, a very clever design. Now, let's take a look at each of these vertebra in depth. So I'm going to draw both a top down view and a side view of a vertebra from each category here. And so I'll start with the cervical vertebra. These are referred to as C1 to C7 and the majority appears like this. However, I say majority because there are some which are a little different and these are C1 and C2. I'll draw these to the side here and it's worth knowing this because they are important. C1 is referred to as the atlas and C2 is referred to as the axis. Now the atlas is what connects the skull to the spine. In fact it's uh, hidden inside the skull and the axis which works with the atlas connects to this and its function is rotational movement. You can see this by looking at the image on screen and this is called a pivot joint but I'll likely do a separate video on joints in the future. So those are two cases where the vertebra are different in comparison to the rest. C3 to C7 are all the same. But what's worth paying attention to is the long extruding section that is referred to as the spinous process because these can sometimes be seen on the surface of the body, especially if that person is very skinny. Now C7 protrudes outwards more than any other cervical vertebra because it is connected to the muscle that holds the head upright. You can probably feel this at the back of your neck and it's a, an important landmark when drawing the human figure. Moving further down the spine we come to the thoracic vertebra and these are labelled T1 to T12. There isn't much movement happening here because it's connected to the ribcage. You'll also notice that the spinous process is different in comparison to how it appeared on the cervical vertebra. Here it is slanting down more and I think this is to protect the spinal cord because the spinal cord runs through each of these vertebras and needs to be protected because that is vital for our survival. Now finally at the bottom of the spine we have the lumbar vertebra and these are larger in size in comparison to the vertebra in other sections. In fact, you've likely noticed that the spine gets thicker the further down you go. So the lumbar vertebra L1 to L5 has the most movement along with the neck bone and the reason why they are thicker than other vertebrae is because they take a lot of pressure from holding up the body. It's this section which flexes most when we move in various directions. Now the sacrum and the coccyx are considered to be part of the spinal column but we will cover that when we move on to studying the pelvis. So now that we know about the structure of the spine and how it works, let's talk about drawing it because that's why we are here learning about it, right? We want this knowledge to improve our understanding of anatomy and therefore improve our ability to draw the human figure. So I watched a video by Proko on the anatomy of the spine in which he firstly goes over the proportions of the spine and how the three sections are considered. He starts by deciding on the size of the spine as a whole and then measures out four equal units, so divide this in half and then in quarters. The lumbar section is one and one quarter units, the cervical section is three quarters of a unit and that leaves two units for the thoracic section. Now he makes a point of saying that everybody's individual proportions will vary a bit anyways. Here I'm going to draw out the spine on a side view in a neutral position. The lumbar section curves around like so at the front and meets the thoracic section which curves around at the back. Remember the thickness of these cylinders will get thinner as we progress to the top where there then is the cervical section which is the straightest of the sections. Now I'll also add the sacrum to this which is going to be about 3 quarters of the lumbar section. Again I will cover the sacrum more when I look at the pelvis. The sacrum curves around like so and tilts with the entire pelvis. 
So this will be how we represent the spine when drawing. I'll rotate this around so that I can view it on various angles, but I'll keep this in a neutral pose. As mentioned earlier, the spine is connected to three major masses, the skull, the ribcage and the pelvis, and so it's a good idea to include these whilst drawing the spine. Of course, at this stage though, we have only covered the skull and not the ribcage and the pelvis, but do not worry because I'm going to just block these out and use some simple forms. Again, I'm taking this from Proko, so be sure to watch his video on the same subject. So here I'm going to draw out the spine and include the three major masses. Now here you'll see me start by drawing out four equally sized units and this is relating back to the eight head unit proportional system by Loomis that we looked at in an earlier episode. I think I've mentioned this before but I'm trying to approach anatomy in a somewhat linear fashion so that I can continually build on top of what I learn. So this method of using head units to judge the proportions of the figure is something that I will be considering continuously. Anyways, here I block out the skull the same way as I blocked out the skull in the last study session and from this I draw out the shape of the spine and I'm going to create a line to do this. Right now I'm drawing this on a three quarter view so I'm mindful of the shape of the spine. To block out the ribcage I create an egg shape and I can also judge the size of this due to the units that I'm using. This ribcage is held by the curve of the thoracic section. The pelvis is probably simplified the most, here I draw this as a, a tilting bucket, firstly drawing an ellipse to define its top plane and this isn't the most descriptive form when it comes to drawing the ellipse but again at this stage for what we are aiming to do it's fine and we will look at both the ribcage and pelvis in separate videos. So this is a three quarter view of the spine in a neutral pose again but with the inclusion of these masses. So to get the hang of drawing this I'm going to rotate this around and draw this on some more angles. So now that I have had some practice drawing out the spine with the three major masses like so, I'm going to do more of these but now I'm going to draw these on various angles and in numerous positions. And so if you have watched Proko's video, you'll know that he actually sets an assignment in which he provides some reference images of the skeleton that you can use to do this. So that's what I was doing here. I was observing the images of the skeleton in different positions and doing my best to draw them out like so. I was also drawing some of these from my imagination. I think having a, an understanding of perspective here can really help to do this and if you are familiar with my videos you'll know that I often cover perspective a lot on this channel so I am fairly confident drawing basic forms like this. What I was trying to consider the most as I did this though was the relationship between the spine and how it dictates the position of the three major masses. I know that these are fixed to the spine and so obviously as the spine moves these move with it. I was also staying mindful of what I discussed earlier in regards to how the spine moves. For instance, it's the lumbar section which can flex the most, along with the cervical section that can move the head, and the rib cage sort of goes along with it as there isn't much movement in the middle. I also had to pay attention to the size of all of these features because again I was trying to stay aware of the head unit system but when the subject is on various angles in perspective it's a lot harder especially when you compare it to drawing those simple straight on views. 
but regardless of all of the factors that I was considering as I did this, I started to really enjoy it and I find that before I start one of these study sessions, you know, when I don't have any idea about these subjects that I'm going to be covering, I'm quite intimidated but once I get going and take it step by step, I get the urge to learn more. We still have a, a long way to go before we have covered the anatomy of the skeleton and even then we'll have all of the muscles and whatnot to cover so it's early days at the moment but I'm feeling optimistic you know I'm just sticking with it and continuing to learn more. Anyways this has been another study session on the spine as always I'll be posting my pages onto the Patreon page so do consider checking that out and with all that being said thanks for joining me today I'll see you in the next one. If you enjoyed the content I create, then do consider becoming a patron on Patreon. You will gain access to exclusive tutorials, study documents, process papers, real-time drawing footage and more. Plus, you will also be supporting me in a more personal way. Other than that, thank you for watching this video and I'll see you soon.